Found primarily among the island's redwood regions, Arctodus dyrus is an imposing creature. Many on the island have started calling it a dire bear, a name which is appropriate both due to its enormity and its territorial nature. The dire bear ignores most non-hostile creatures while going about its daily routine of scavenging for meat and edible plant life. That is, until intruders enter the territory it considers its own, at which point the creature ferociously attacks. Most often, it is smartest to just run from an angry dire bear. Once tamed, the dire bear is a strong and reliable mount. It can carry vast quantities of goods and can sprint for extremely long, nearly infinite periods. It is not the fastest creature from a hard stop, but after building up momentum, its sustained overland speed builds to among the best of the island. Of course, being able to feed a dire bear both meat and plant life makes keeping one fairly convenient regardless of the environment. Arctodus has a fondness for honey and can harvest it without getting stung or destroying the hive. Perhaps more rewarding while you are riding it, those pesky bees will completely ignore you. The first marsupial I've encountered on the island is the Procoptodon vivincurus. Standing nearly three meters tall, it is among the largest jumping creatures I've heard of. It is a fairly peaceful herbivore that will immediately flee when aggressed upon. One of Procoptodon's most unique features is its pouch. Unlike many pouch marsupials, Procoptodon's pouch is relatively dry and has little in the way of sticky or oily fluids. I assume this is good for the joey, but I have not figured out exactly why yet. Its other unique feature, powerful hind legs, can knock back aggressors much larger in stature. Procoptodons show great precision when leaping, as if they can accurately target the landing without fail. I've seen them effortlessly hop and land from heights that would flatten other creatures. It seems Procoptodon's knack for carrying things has increased its load-bearing capacity. Procoptodon's dry pouch makes it an excellent beast of burden that can carry far more than other creatures of its size. Additionally, it appears to provide an optimal environment for nourishing babies, so much that upon maturing, they have even more vigor. Found in small numbers within the island's colder regions, Calicotherium obsidioequus is normally a peaceful herbivore that prefers to spend its days lazing about or playing with its family. It is very territorial, however, and the entire family, young and old, will turn against an encroaching creature at just the slightest provocation. A memorable scene to stumble upon is a group of Calicotherium playing. One odd playtime activity for Calicotherium is hurling large balls of snow or mud rocks at each other. Smaller creatures in the area shy away from Calicotherium during this exertion for fear of being buried in snow or gravel. While many creatures are useful while attacking a fortress, Calicotherium can be trained as mobile artillery. Its unique playtime habit becomes a rather devastating long-range assault tactic when it is given boulders to throw rather than snowballs. Here is another example of a creature that seems to have evolved beyond its historical traits. Everything points to this being a saltwater ray, but Manta Mobula has developed the ability to swim into the island's rivers and shallows, as well as through the open ocean. Perhaps there were originally two types of ray on the island before, but years of interbreeding combined their lineage. Normally docile, Manta Mobula is a carnivore only in that it naturally consumes plankton. Fortunately, Manta Mobula is usually not aggressive, unless encroached. Its tail is incredibly sharp and can pierce through thick hide and armor with ease. While not the fastest swimmer around the island, Manta Mobula is among the deadliest of small ocean mounts. Tribes who value striking power over speed often keep large schools of Manta to ride. Its capability to briefly leap out of water provides it a showy tactic for avoiding combat as well. A quick jab through the heart of an unsuspecting survivor can easily take them by surprise. Thusly, many tribes use it as an escort for their slower cargo-carrying swimmers. Presiding almost solely within the island swamps, Diplocolis natatori nutrix is a small amphibian that primarily eats minor fish. It rounds out what I consider to be the middle bottom of the ecosystem, feeding on the tinier non-insect creatures of the island while itself being a common snack for the larger carnivores. Because so many creatures prey on it, Diplocolis has become very skittish and often flees at the first sign of trouble. 
it uses its amphibious nature to escape into whichever environment its predator isn't native to. Diplocolis's unique capability to retain vast quantities of oxygen allows it to effectively remain submerged for hours at a time, usually outlasting even other amphibious creatures that might otherwise prey upon it. There are only a few uses for tame Diplocolis. It is primarily kept for the, rather disgusting, practice of employing a Diplocolis as an oxygen bag. Diplocolis stores air in the bladders of its head, and divers can suck from these bladders to take deep breaths while submerged, supporting long-term underwater exploration without the use of external gear. Surprisingly, Diplocolis is also extremely efficient when it comes to hunting trilobites. Carbonomys obibulus is one of the least aggressive creatures on the island. Were it not for the plethora of predators on the island, I'm quite certain that it would spend its days basking in the sun, eating, or sleeping. Carbonomys leads a simple, solitary life. Nevertheless, it seems to be one of the most peaceful animals I have yet encountered. With its slow walking speed, the only things that keep it safe are its surprisingly fast swim speed and its incredibly thick shell, which can absorb tremendous damage. Carbonomys's swift swim rate, fairly high strength, superior shell defenses, and lack of real threat makes it an ideal armored mount for many survivors who shy away from violence. It can carry its rider to the ocean's resources at fairly high speed, and is not particularly dangerous to tame. Unlike many of the herd animals on the island, Ankylosaurus crassicutus tends to live in small family units. I believe they can afford to stick with smaller groups because of their incredibly thick skin, for which they're named. Despite not being among the largest of the island's herbivores, Ankylosaurus is one of the more difficult creatures to take down. Its thick, armored skin seems to make it more than a match for several of the mid-sized predators that would otherwise hunt it. Reckless carnivores are just as likely to hurt themselves on Ankylosaurus' spikes as they are to get hit by its tail. Without a doubt, the best trait of a trained Ankylosaurus is its enormously dense tail. This tail is powerful enough to quickly shatter the resource-laden rocks of the island. One of the wealthier human tribes on the island utilizes a squad of Ankylosaurus in its mines and quarries. The creature's affinity for metal enables it to carry raw ore at an effectively reduced weight. Ichthyosaurus curiosa is a comparatively small carnivore found in the waters around the island. It is slightly larger than a human, but that's still small compared to the leviathans roaming these waters. It seems to be very interested in any creature around its size, often approaching and following humans swimming through its waters with a friendly nudge. Despite its appearance, the Ichthyosaurus is neither a fish nor an ocean mammal. Like many creatures in the waters around the island, it is an aquatic reptile. I can't think of a better mount for someone starting to explore the island's seas and waterways. Ichthyosaurus is a comparatively fast swimmer, and even in the wild, will cozy right up to you and try to figure out what you're doing. Taming these is actually pretty easy, as they seem to love humans and will be fed and tamed without the use of violence. Lording over the skies across the island, Argentavis atricolum has few aerial rivals. It is a small consolation for the island's other avian creatures, then, that Argentavis seems to have little interest in anything alive. Quite apart from what I would have guessed, Argentavis does not have the stooped neck, typical of modern buzzards and vultures. I don't know if it adapted the stronger neck to deal with the predators on the island, or its lineage derives from before the stooped neck became common in carrion-eating birds. Whichever it might be, it has enabled Argentavis to carry smaller creatures with its beak. Argentavis is actually slower than the island's far more common Pteranodon, but it possesses significantly more stamina and can sustain flight for approximately three times as long. Its weighty stature, in comparison to the Pteranodon, allows it to utilize its talons to support the weight of an additional passenger. Considering its saddle doubles as a mobile crafting station, it makes Argentavis an excellent creature for traveling and hauling cargo over long distances. Usually found in the deepest parts of the water around the island, Ammonitina multiamicus has a strange relationship with the other creatures of the deep. It must do something beneficial for them since every nearby sea creature defends Ammonitina when it is attacked. What this distinct symbiosis is based on, 
alas, I have not yet discovered. Ammonitina has also made its way into the deeper parts of many underwater caves. Even within these caves, the creature will draw attention if assaulted, making harvesting its resource-rich shell a tricky proposition, depending on what other dangers may be lurking nearby. Like many of the untamable ocean dwellers, Ammonitina still has enough utility to be a valuable hunting target. If a tribe is willing to risk the wrath of nearby would-be protectors, Ammonitina bile can be harvested from the innards of its corpse. This bile can then be worked over with other chemicals to produce powerful concoctions, the most notable being a mixture that causes creatures to become enraged and attack the source of the scent. While Kendrosaurus aethiopicus is considerably smaller than its close relative, Stegosaurus regium, it is much more formidable in matters of self-defense. In fact, it is arguably the pound-for-pound -pound champion of not only this Stegosaurus, but when encountered in close-knit fighting packs, ranks atop the island's herbivorous dinosaurs in general. Thanks to its wickedly sharp defensive spikes, any creature that attacks Kentrosaurus is likely to be reversely wounded in turn, and it is capable of piercing even the thickest of hides and armor when it goes on the offensive. I have personally witnessed the Kentrosaurus fell much larger predators in a single such impaling maneuver. Underestimating Kentrosaurus can be a fatal mistake, particularly when it is in a herd. When traveling in numbers, Kentrosaurus seems to grow much more aggressive, increasing the range at which it will defend its territory. Survivors have seen little success in their attempts to ride Kentrosaurus, owing to its spikes and hot-headed temperament. However, a tamed herd of Kentrosaurus can effectively defend a compound and take on larger carnivores. Once impaled by its attack, the Kentrosaurus slams the attacker on the ground continuously, helping to turn the tide of a pitched battle. Thylacoleo fertimorsis is a large, powerful marsupial that can often be found hunting around trees among the island's redwoods. Its long claws and semi-opposable digits make it an apt climber, a quality that Thylacoleo uses to its advantage while hunting. It clambers up large trees and waits to ambush passing prey by pouncing upon them. When something that large jumps onto a target, the victim becomes stunned and doesn't stand much of a chance. Thylacoleo's most notable fighting quality is its powerful jaws. Once it bites its prey, it locks its jaw in an iron grip that can hold most smaller creatures in place. Thylacoleo then goes on to savage its prey with its sharp claws. If it needs to escape from a fight, Thylacoleo uses its muscular hind legs to jump back to safety among the trees. Thylacoleo is a moderately strong mount, and its ability to climb trees and jump long distances makes it useful for traversal. As such, developing tribes often tame it. Small raiding parties particularly favor Thylacoleo, as it is well suited to ambushes and unfair fights. Parasaurolophus amphibio has one of the more interesting adaptations of any creature I've seen on the island. Like all parasaur, it has a signature crest on its head. Very docile at first, I've been able to approach the creature without disturbing it. If startled, however, the creature can vocalize a distress call to the surrounding area that warns of danger. Parasaurolophus appears to be low on the food chain and is hunted by everything, creatures and humans alike, which explains its skittish nature. It is a good source of meat and hide if you can manage to keep up with it long enough to kill it. Despite being what most tribes consider a relatively useless creature to tame, I once met an interesting woman who had tamed an entire herd of them. She informed me that many overlooked the creature's potential. She even graciously gifted me a fancy saddle to put on my own Parasaurolophus one day. As a relatively simple creature to domesticate, Parasaurolophus is commonly one of the first mounts a tribe will be able to acquire. Its ability to run relatively fast for lengthy intervals makes it a solid mode of medium-range transportation, though it has almost no ability to defend itself or its rider in a traditional sense. Smaller creatures, however, appear to be frightened by the horn of Parasaurolophus, although it doesn't do much damage. It also has decent weight-bearing capabilities, which could prove useful for nomadic tribes as they work to establish a presence on the island. A smaller relative of Sarcosuchus, Caprosuchus paludentium, is a water-based carnivore primarily found lurking among the island swamps. A naturally fast runner that is even faster in the water it is a solitary hunter that picks off small to medium creatures, 
especially those isolated from their pack. When attacking, Caprosuchus uses two main tactics. First, it patiently waits below the water surface and when the target is sufficiently close by, will perform a lateral jump that it uses to quickly close distance with its prey and drag it underwater. Secondly, it attacks the prey's vital areas specifically to drain its stamina. These two techniques effectively prevent most creatures from escaping Caprosuchus once an assault has begun. Survivors are generally split about the usefulness of Caprosuchus. Some love its speed both in and out of the water, essentially making it among the fastest small-sized all-terrain mounts when traveling through the wetlands. Others do not like how relatively frail Caprosuchus is and do not think its high speed and ensnaring attacks make up for this shortcoming. Megalania moraspidae is among the largest creatures found throughout the island's complicated cave networks. Reaching up to three meters long, it can traverse vertically up cave walls with little difficulty thanks to its powerful claws. Fortunately, Megalania's size means it is unlikely to sneak up on anyone. Unfortunately for Spelunkers, it is an aggressive and dangerous creature nonetheless. Like other Veronidae, Megalania is a venomous creature. Its poison is slow-acting, but will drain the victim's effective strength and health until death, unless cured by a rare antidote. That said, the Megalania's prey are usually ripped apart well before they succumb to the poison's long-term effects. The rare ability of Megalania to effortlessly climb sheer environmental walls makes it a highly sought-after mount. While it is by no means the fastest, strongest, or toughest mount, the manner in which it can effortlessly scale mountains, clamber up barricades, hide in trees, or upside down, ensures it will always have place in any tribe's stables. Megatherium formicava is one of the larger mammals on the island. This is most shocking because it is essentially a giant sloth, if you crossbred it with an elephant and a bear. Because of its size and girth, the Megatherium is uncommonly resistant to being knocked unconscious. Despite primarily being a herbivore, a typical Megatherium is very intent on consuming the island's many insects. It is particularly adept at removing their insides without damaging much of the shell, maximizing extraction of chitin. The otherwise slow and peaceful Megatherium becomes faster and aggressive in the presence of these creatures. Megatherium is an incredibly useful creature to tame, so long as you don't intend to fight other tribes. Its enormity, high resistance to torpor, and voracious attitude towards insects and arachnids makes it ideal for farming large quantities of chitin from the bugs of the island, or simply defending against them. When someone asks me what the fastest creatures on the island are, Gallimimus is always a contender. Unlike the island's many armored animals, Gallimimus issues strong defenses for the ability to outrun pretty much anything. A skittish herbivore, Gallimimus even looks nervous when eating in a peaceful, clear meadow. Having no real way to harm predators, it simply runs away and uses its agility to stay safe. I've even seen wild Gallimimus outrun speed-trained Utah Raptors. There are two general camps on the use of tamed Gallimimus. One camp thinks that their inability to effectively harm hostile creatures and their inability to harvest most resources makes them primarily a burden to the tribe. The other camp thinks that their extreme speed and ability to jump long distances is among the best for scouting and exploring. However, both camps agree that its ability to quickly transport multiple tribe members is uniquely beneficial. Sincerely, Helena Walker.